Hello. It is I. Forgotten McFamily Tree. Welcome to Season 4's entry in the Just the Content series of Modcast Rehashes. First up, we have Season 4, Episode 3, Homer the Heretic. Written by George Meyer. Directed by Jim Reardon. Enjoy. They, they're in a place which I, I later found out was the church. The doors are frozen shut. We see more just for a second hugging herself. And we see Rod and Todd appearing to hug Maud also for warmth. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, all, I got. that's all I could get out of that, that one second clip. The only thing I have to say about it is that she's cold. <laughs> they're all cold. They're all cold. Yeah. But here's one thing I did. If I, if I, I was going to bring up the other week. She was sat in the car, in the freezing cold, where Ned was dressed up in all the clothes he had, whereas Maud was sat on the inside. However, they could have had the heater on, couldn't they, I guess? Could have had the engine on. Yeah. All right, and moving swiftly the on. They did have the candle. Moving swiftly on. That's the shortest clip we've done so far, but you know. It's all, it, we do long and short here. We, uh, we, don't, we don't hold no grudges. The clip short, we'll give it its time in the sun. Clip two. Maud, still in the locked-in church, dutifully sat in her pew, Reverend Lovejoy droning on, they're all kind of like, they've had enough of this now. She turns anxiously at the door and she's watching uh, groundskeeper Willie, who for some reason has a blowtorch with him and is attempting to unfreeze the door. Yep, that's what <laughs> happened. <laughs> that is what happened. And I guess the only thing I had to ask about this is why does Willie have a blowtorch with him in church? I think it's just because he's the groundskeeper. So I think it's because he's, uh, I imagine it's it's likely that he's got his tractor out there with all of his tools in it. But he, I don't know why he's got it specifically on him because he can't get out to the tractor to, uh, maybe it was the church's blowtorch. It's possible. And also, just for the basic fire safety regulations, there would be another door somewhere. So yeah. I, I don't know. There maybe. Is. There's several doors, but there's also a lot of glass windows that they could uh, smash. But there wasn't a fire, was there? Everybody was just cold. Sure. Um, Maud's just getting on with it. She's not front and centre making a scene. She's just, again, she's very, very reactive. She's just, oh, well, this is what's happening. I guess I'll wait it out. Oh, well, this, th these events are unfolding in front of me. I should just continue to sit here and let them unfold without without interjecting myself into them in any way. There's nothing There's nothing yeah. Maud can do here. Is that like, that's almost true. Exactly. I know Lovejoy said she had no catchphrases, but if she were to have one, maybe it could be. There's nothing Maud can do here. Yeah, that basically sums up, I'd say about 60% of her appearances. She's a passive character. She's not an active, responsive character, unless it comes to something she's passionate about, which is usually other people enjoying themselves. <laughs> I guess so. So Maud opens the door uh, and Maud, Maud looks towards the door to see Willie trying to blast it with his blowtorch. And we go to clip three, still in the church. And we, you know, for those of us only watching the clips, we find out that home has decided not to go, which I guess is the heretic part of it. Although, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't go to yeah. church. But did he, maybe he said some other stuff, I don't know. But anyway, he's decided not to go. Willie gets the doors open and Maud's like staring intently at this now. She, everyone's leaning in. They can see the doors are just about to be open and they've been in there for, oh, maybe upwards of 30 minutes or whatever. So the doors open. The, the icy cold snow blasts in and they all start moving towards the door. Maud's nowhere to be seen. There is, Maud does not appear in that, in that view of the church, nor does Ned or Rod or Todd. Now I counted, there's the about three rows from the back. So they got a good vantage point right on the edge. Nowhere to be seen. What's going on, Nathan? I would say the Christian thing to do, and I think Reverend Lovejoy mentions this, and he says like, please Christians don't push. He does say that. It's a very Flanders, response to let everybody else go first so they somehow moved further away from the door or did maybe they rolled underneath the pews so as to get out of everybody's way okay okay kids just crouch down under the pews so that everybody else can get out first i imagine flanders would do that even in a fire not just in this far less dangerous situation well yeah and flanders does Flanders is in a fire later in this episode. And does he let everyone go no, first? No, he saves Homer's life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
But actually, yeah, that does answer a bit of my question as to why in the last clip they're standing in front of some charred curtains. Because I do, <laughs> I remember this episode, but I don't remember the details. It's a long time since I've seen, seen the actual episode. So anyway, they're all set charging for the door and Lovejoy is saying, don't run, Christians, which is a very really Christian thing to do. Bart, however, decides that he's going to use people's shoulders and heads to run over the top of the crowd towards the door. But charming Bart, you know, as he's going by, he's saying, hey, coming through, how you doing? You know, how you doing, baby? Nice hat. And the classic, classic Bart charm. And he passes by those distinctive, big round eyeballs with the eyelashes coming off them. And the big gingerish I don't know for lack of a better word hairstyle uh, but it doesn't seem like Bart actually jumps on a Maud's shoulders or head no he doesn't he, he avoids her which is nice of him but now she's given up on this whole you know let's have, let everybody else go first thing but you don't see Ned or the kids she's just going on her own she's getting out of there she doesn't care she's she's bolting for the door and it's every it's every flan for himself I would say this teaches us and again, this will come up a lot in the future, but on a surface level, she loves Ned, Rod and Todd. She loves her life. But in those gut instinct, deep moments, she doesn't care about any of them. She's in it for herself. She's It's every mod for herself when it comes to, at the end of the day, that's how she is. So she loves, uh, she loves her family, but... If the shit hits the fan, she's getting out of there. She loves she loves the family, but she loves Maud more. Yes. Now you could cut her a bit of slack because it is it is entirely possible that she's holding the hands of Rod and Todd and dragging them with her. Because my question I would be I don't think that's the case, because Rod's quite see. tall. You may just have seen his hair just bobbing up at uh, eye level. Here's what's interesting. No one else in that scene is a character I recognise. Maud is the only character in the whole of that scene that Bart jumps on top of all their shoulders, that was recognisable to me. Uh, and I just wonder why, why would they choose to only animate Maud and a bunch of just random characters? That is fascinating. It is it's I, fascinating. It's a truly fascinating nugget. <laughs> it is. Again, she's associated heavily with the church. So in random crowd scenes, she isn't the first person you think of but in terms of female characters at the church i think she is top of the list because helen helen isn't as godly yeah and helen as the as the as the priest's wife she'd probably right at the front of the church sat with uh, on the pews and she she'd probably stay with lovejoy they probably got a basement with in fact they live there she so doesn't they, they have no they're, they're in no rush to leave probably have yeah. all their jumpers no, in the back they don't live at the church they live at home with their daughter Jessica, but I like to imagine that Helen's in the back somewhere in a in a small room with a heated radiator, just away from everybody else. I wouldn't put it past her. Maybe she's the anti mod. She is in a way. She is in a, in a very in a very real way, just as Edna and Marge are. Every every anti mod reflects a facet of the true mod. Don't forget Selma. Tell me about Selma. How is Selma the anti mod? I just picked picked a random name, but Selma smokes, Selma's rude, Selma's loveless, and she has boofy hair. Maud is none of those things. She's the anti-Selma in many ways. So who yes. is the anti-Maud is a very good segment that we will be using to pad out our runtime over the next little while. What would Maud have made had Todd continued his rambunctious and naughty streak and followed Bart across the shoulders of the parishioners i think she would have um grabbed for him but i come think here, again it would come have here todd yeah because <laughs> again she was the first one to shout at him but i think it would be a conversation for later she does tend to she doesn't like a public display so i think she would save it for uh when they got home and then he would be no non for ice milk for a week no bible stories he would be for it <laughs> In short, he would be for it, for the high jump, I yes. imagine. Yes. Clip four. Ned arrives at Homer's door with the family. Hey, neighbour, I've heard about your heresy. Now, heresy, just to explain for people who don't know, heresy is going against the teaching of the church, unlike blasphemy, which is going against the word of God. So Homer hasn't actually done anything bad to God, but he has gone against the church by not, not turning up. Homer's done very many, many bad things against God, I'm sure, in the past. But in a specific instance, him just not going to church. However, Neddy turns up. We've made it our mission to win you back to our flock. And Ned, 
Is it he's armed with an acoustic guitar? And who's stood in front of him? Rod and Todd. And who stood next to him? And they start to sing. The whole family start to sing. God said to Noah, we're going to build an Aki Aki. It's a great song. Oh, but, you know, on the clip that I got, on the clip that I got, the person who sent me the clip was making laughing and, and snorting noises over the entire sound as I'm pressing the headphones close to my ears to see if I can pick out Roswell's voice in there and thus prove my biological brother wrong once again for the third show in a row in a segment called Nathan tries to persuade me that Maud isn't singing. They're singing, and I can't tell Nathan, so, you know, the jury is out. Is Maud singing? No, no, but it's just, it's getting ridiculous now that almost every time she pops up, she is singing in some way, including the next next clips with the monorail. Now, you, you picked out the monorail already. You knew about this one, but be honest, had you remembered the Arky Arky song? No, I had completely forgotten about this one. But you, but you are claiming that you can't pick out Maud's voice in that melange. Now, I think it's tricky because I think her singing voice is going to be very similar to the boys. My only my only logical thought of this is if they haven't given her a line in the episode, they aren't going to get her to come in to sing back up. Yeah, but, but you're using real world logic, not, not, not Simpsons logic. In the world of Springfield, I still like the idea that she's having some kind of secret... She's having some kind of secret arc or relationship with learning to sing herself and not lip syncing. Because eventually she'll get to the point where she sings her own lines. But as of now, she seems so scared that she doesn't even sing along to things. She just mouths. I like your theory there. That's a very good theory. Because what you're trying to claim is now, even though she repeatedly in almost every episode is singing and you earlier claimed famously that she only ever sang two things she but but you're trying to claim that she's right now just lip syncing at first you said it was to give the boys and to make them bring the boys out and give them a bit of confidence and now you're saying it's because she has a pathological terror of public singing performances and we're going to see this secret arc blossom over the next several seasons until eventually we see Maud sing loud and proud. Yeah, and she sings twice, and the first time is Go Tell It. Well, the first time in chronological Simpsons time is Go Tell It on the Mountain, because that's a flashback to Rod and Todd. They're quite young. So something happened between Go Tell It on the Mountain and I Got You, Babe. In those, like, five Simpsons years between Rod and Todd being the ages of five and six and yeah like nine and ten whatever mm. something happened to her and that's certainly a theory that we want to get our teeth into a little bit more hmm yeah we won't get to that episode that episode is season 29 oh good lord so we won't be there for a while yet and so whether or not Maud was singing we have to move on the jury's still out so they track homer down to work and they're harassing with singing over the phone and we hear we hear them singing in the background again hard to tell if Maud's involved and then they track him and follow him home uh, follow him on his way back home and they're driving next to him in the car and Maud has the freakiest Donald Duck face uh, I think I've ever seen this uh, and Rod and Todd have this wacky gleeful look and they're shouting get those animals out on the arky arky and it's full-on cult they're full on cult. And this is flanderization. So flanderization is the trope when a character starts off having several things about them, but little by little, one trait just keeps getting doubled down on until eventually it is the entire character. And what happened with Ned, except especially in these seasons, is that he just became a churchy do-gooder, right? And there was nothing else about him. And so yeah. And this became an idea of flanderization. So anytime you see a character who be who becomes like that, then this is what it is. Yeah, it's outside of a comedy. Com it works in this kind of context, but it's sort of just, it's the opposite of good writing, isn't it? It's like the opposite of character development. Yeah, and it's like, especially in comedy, I imagine it's very tempting to do because you get something that's funny and then you just do more of it, just like a little kid who, who realises that making fart noises is funny, so you just do farts all the time. Actually, there's that Spongebob episode, isn't it, where he keeps ripping his pants and Big Larry came around and 
da, 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 and then and SpongeBob just keeps ripping his pants all the time, and it's like diminishing returns on the uh, on the <laughs> pants ripping hilarity. But this is when it happens yeah. to an entire character. Yeah, no, I re I remember. That. I thought you were going to say it was just uh, like his vocabulary, but yeah, I've heard that. Uh heard that before i can't think of any examples on other tv shows maybe like the office with characters like creed where they started out kind of kind of normal and in the background and then by the end creed was just the most manic kind of character they really played up that he was super mysterious and kept having all these little things going on and i think that's a bit of a trope and tv tropes is awesome right so you can go off down they've, they've got a name for everything so there's there's all these kind of like splinters of this flanderization when a character is developed in a certain way blah 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 but my question was do you think that maud became part of flanderization or did she not was she not given that much tlc did, did they not develop her enough to even become flanderized no i think she kind of because again flanders was around in season one and a bit of season two before maud showed up and like i said at the beginning he isn't very religious like the first episode of the christmas special you see ned and todd it's just sort of about them being having a better life sort of similar to the barbecue episode, to the leftorium episode yeah he was just there at first to show that homer's life was not as good and the religious stuff didn't come in till after Maud. Because Maud comes in in the golf game, which isn't that religious, but they are praying at the end of it. So she's already, they've already set that up for her. So no, yeah, she didn't, uh, she didn't have a chance to get flanderized. No, but she essentially became the, the only thing that people would know her for other than her t-shirt related death spoiler alert is is yeah. her protesting and her churchiness maybe she's just she's just a one-dimensional character that didn't that didn't live long enough to get flanderized but uh, who knows so they, yeah. they're chasing after them and you know todd or, or rod one of them says dad the heathens are getting away and so it turns into a car chase and the funky music comes on and uh, you know homer goes under the train and uh, the flanders somehow managed to jump through through the carriage of the train through the open doors of the of the freight train onto the other side and i i remember this this made this tickled you because yeah cause you send me all of the clips from your phone right so i get all the background noises and reactions it's like a laugh track and the simpsons doesn't have a laugh track right so so that's good yeah. and uh what would maud good lord what would maud have made of this so you know uh, episode after episode we're talking about how they're risk averse and don't like to gamble and it's hard to say this isn't a gamble with their lives to just get homer to go back to church and save a soul but to actually drive your car that recklessly with your entire family in it what's maud thinking yeah again we're gonna have to because she doesn't speak so you don't hear her shouting like what the hell are you doing or anything like that so she's she's in on it she's part of it and again i think it comes back to her uh, lust for death or just sort of some kind of yeah this is how she lives these are the in these moments this is how she truly lives and the same with ned you see ned go through phases of you know like vegas like he'll either he'll, he'll go from being buckled down to doing like the crit because he let's not forget that he does marry another woman whilst he's married to Mott. <laughs> But she never finds, she dies before she finds out. Rod and Todd find out eventually, the wife returns, but Maud never finds out. My goodness. Yeah, she's, when they jump through the train, they could have, yeah, they could have all, like, he could have killed his entire family. That's what made me laugh. Because we've got yeah. the depth, right? We've got the depth of the context. To the average watcher, it's just Flanders doing a funny jump, but to us, it's Maud, our, our our whole re reason for watching this show right there in the very hands of Flanders living on the ledge beyond the edge and jumping through trains and Maud God bless her rather than losing her shit at Ned and forcing him to stop the car and saying enough of this madness she just she's just gunning for it go get him go get him now I know you know they're evangelical and they want to save that soul but at what cost Nathan at what cost and it's leading me to think that maybe maybe she saw those t-shirts coming maybe she walked into them and thought i can handle this <laughs> and she couldn't i think so it's like phil anselmo from pantera when he decided that he could handle hard drugs 
And then he realized he couldn't. And he said, you know, after that, all I did is I just had a bottle of whiskey and went to bed, you know. Maybe she is like the lead singer of Pantera in this respect, and she thinks she can handle anything the world's got to throw at her, but she wasn't, I tell you, she wasn't as lucky as Phil. Phil came back from his brush with death. Um, not like Dying by Daryl, but Phil came back from his brush with death. Maud, however, did not. She, she fell, she fell that 20 meters or so, and her back and neck and skull were, <laughs> were all crushed. We were all crushed and broken at the bottom of that cartoon stadium. However, yeah. moving on, let's not dwell. Let's not dwell on those dark times that are to, that are to come. So they chase him and uh, they eventually, you know, they track him down and then Halma jumps off and ends up in a, in a garbage thing. But we don't care because Maud's not in that bit. We could imagine what she's doing in the car, but we also know she's alive with glee. This repression, it's repression, isn't it? She's repressed that inner feeling through her religion. It doesn't mean her religiosity is not real. It just means that she's repressed that, that wild side of herself so much that it's only through allowing her husband to risk her children's lives that she can feel that spark. My goodness, it's yeah. quite a roller coaster ride considering she's just a minor character. I mean, she's definitely been in more life-threatening scrapes in the last season than I've been in my whole, whole live long life. Yeah, and she's always, again, there's this sort of, there's a relationship with death and Maud from sort of very early on. Maybe this is our first example of that. She, there was a few times where it came, you know, she was close already and she, she survived, which led her to this false sense of confidence that she would be fine when she saw the t-shirts come in and she thought, eh, I'll be okay. Now you can't see this, listeners, but I'm shaking my head, not in disagreement with Nathan, but in disbelief at how Maud lived her life. Because I tell you what, you can only laugh in the face of death so many times before death laughs back. Clip five. Okay, so this is the carrot curtains. So they're stood in front of a bunch of carrot curtains that are all charred and have clearly been set on fire. Homer says, I'll be there in the front row center. So I'm reading into this that Homer's, you know, been persuaded by whatever reason. It's unimportant. It doesn't matter what. <laughs> it doesn't matter that Ned, as you suggest, may have saved his life. Uh, but it's irrelevant because we're only interested in Maud. So, Ned, so Homer goes back to church. And of course, ha ha ha, Homer Simpson, he's just fast asleep in the church which I imagine is what, how the episode started. We see Maud sat right next to him with a stone, icy stone cold look on her face. She is, she is no fan of Homer J, let's put it that way. No, he's just, he's basically fallen asleep on her as well. Not again, quite. I thought it was made almost, almost, which is, that was, why I, that was why I thought they chose to have it as Maud rather than Ned or somebody because of just this sort of, this frayed relationship between the two. And it would be, yeah, just another another page in the diary for her if he fell asleep on her at church. Who, like, yeah, because which character would accept this without making some kind of reaction? You know, if you'd had Mo or a groundskeeper Willie, you can imagine they would have, like, attacked Homer. But we don't want that. Yeah. We just want somebody who's going to put up with it and be like, Moo. and Ned probably would have, but maybe Mo's a better choice. But that look on her face is stone cold, Nathan. You would not want to be on the receiving end of that look. Homer Simpson... Couldn't go less, as we know. He doesn't. He has no regard whatsoever for Maud Flanders, unless she's got her her busty boobs showing. In which case, he's gonna slab her and blob her all over her like a like the dog he is. Yes. There's only one the one thing that I have to say about this clip that doesn't involve Maud, but this is sort of a well known. It's a big big plot hole. Basically, Homer continues to miss church. The house sets on fire, and Ned. Ned arrives and saves him, and everything's fine. But it's never explained why Ned was not at church, why Ned was around to save Homer when Homer was specifically missing church at that time. So Ned yeah. was also missing. Now, there's clearly a gag there. There's clearly a gag where his, his you know, goodness sense goes off or something. They missed a trick there, but um, yeah. it's, a, it's a major gaping plot hole. However, as you say, not mod related and therefore not our business, not our problem. Simpsons writers, though, come on. So 
That's the end of the episode, except for we see a brief glimpse of Homer having a dream where he sees an angel fly. I thought maybe it's foreshadowing, maybe it was Maud, it's not. It's just a faceless angel. That could be from the dream that we talked about last week, but probably not. There's the episode, Homer the Heretic. What are we taking away from that? She's not, she's not, so I've got a lot to do, but she's around. This is, this is the point of the whole thing, to find out what she was doing in day-to-day -day life. And by day-to-day -day life, do you mean harassing a man and almost causing her entire family to die? It's, it's, yeah. it's not really a regular day at the beach, is it? No, but in terms of Maud appearances, it's pretty, you know, this was a pretty low, low episode in terms of content, but she still almost died. Hi, and drama. She sang. she sang. Oh, did she? Is that an admission? Uh, no, she didn't actually sing. Backtrack. There right. will be no admissions. She I like it. Okay, so we're moving on. Second up, Season 4, Episode 4, Lisa the Beauty Queen, written by Jeff Martin, directed by Mark Kirkland, aired October 15th, 1992. So clip one, the Flanders, Ned, wins second prize in some blimp style competition, and the prize is a handsome shoe buffer. Now Maud is delighted, and we actually get a face forward Maud, and in my notes, which you can access should you so desire, we get a full on picture of face forward Maud, which is very unusual. And uh, Maud is delighted, and um, yeah. Yeah, she looks happy. Marge does mention post-mortem, post-mortem. Nice. That um, Maud owned several pairs of shoes, so I think shoes could be added to something. I don't think Maud collects shoes, but I'd say she has an interest in them. So now she gets to keep them super clean and shiny. Maud, Maud. Marge, after death, suggested Maud even had a fetish for shoes. Has she had like four yeah. pairs? <laughs> Yeah, something like that. What was the other thing? Um, yeah, she's happy. And again, this is the first time we've really seen something good happen to them. I mean, good things are few five. I mean, the Leftorium episode where where they saved, where the where the shot was saved, was good. But it was it was the precursor to that was horrible. Whereas this is just a straight. Yeah, they've had moments of, like you know things have come back around for them. But this is just there was no trauma before, uh, beforehand. They just entered a competition and. Came second place and i'm guessing homer wins first place he does which in itself is a coincidence that two neighbors would win the first two prizes and a reversal of the standard trope that the flanders are better than the simpsons and always have a better life though in reality they are they have horrific things happen to them on a regular basis the grass is always greener for homer <laughs> But uh, he seems to forget that yeah. Flanders is losing wives left, right and centre and having his house destroyed and his business destroyed. None of which has really happened to Homer. Yeah, it literally, I don't know if it cut off that clip before Homer speaks, but he looks sad and says, I wanted to win a shoe buffer. Yes, he's a, he's a, he's a very selfish man, Homer J. Simpson. But this ain't about Homer, so yeah. plowing on. So is that the only time that, that Maud actually appears in the Duffless episode? Yeah, that's it. That's there's no background scenes, nothing. Uh, well, it's too bad those, that pe one. those people were robbed of a chance to get a little bit of moored into their eyeglasses. Third, it's a biggie. Season four, episode twelve. Marge versus the monorail, written by Conan O'Brien, directed by Rich Moore, aired January fourteenth, nineteen ninety-three. So this this one, she again, she appears a little bit more, but not too much. Town hall meeting. Mayor Quimby is throwing out some figures which Lisa hotly contests. Um, but then Maud, bold as brass, just stands up and says, excuse me, maybe we could use the money to hire firemen to finally put out the blaze on the east side of town. Now, permanent fires in Springfield seems to be a fairly common thing. Isn't there like a tyre factory that's also permanently on fire? Yeah, there's the tyre fire that's sort of always there, which I kind of just assumed that's what she was talking about here ah, for some reason. But it's weird that they didn't specify that. Maybe it was too early, maybe they hadn't introduced that yet. But yeah, she's straight up, she's the first, but not. this is the first time we've seen her, like, not just in the Flanders or the Simpsons family, but she's the first person in the whole town to stand up and say something. She's she's she has that bravery at times, you know, for for all of her quietness. She doesn't seem to be against speaking out 
whenever she feels like it. She has the confidence and she's uh, unshaken by Homer's attempts to put her off by yelling boring at her. Well, Homer just stands up and shouts, you're yeah, boring, and there is just no reaction from Maud. She just totally blanks him and just ignores Homer J as she is, as, she, as really, that is the best course of action. She ignored him in the last episode when he fell asleep pretty much on her in church. She ignored him um, or tried to when he wished evil on them after the chicken bone incident. So it's probably the best course of action really with Homer. However, it then cuts immediately to Mr. Schnurob, which, you know, spoiler, is Mr. Burns with a moustache on. Um, and the only thing I could say about this is, first of all, was there any resolution to Maud or did just Homer just shout her down and then she sat down with no more conversation? And second... Yeah, that's it. That There's no... Um, her idea isn't isn't taken any further than that. To be fair, they are, they are distracted because Marge has an idea that they almost all vote for and then they get distracted by the uh, arrival of Lyle Longley. But that's several minutes or seconds later. She stands up, she says a perfectly reasonable... A perfectly reasonable request which she ignored by everybody and shouted by by Homer Simpson. And I can only imagine she sits down. What what's going through her mind? What's on her face when she sits down having just stood up, thrown out an idea and then just been shouted down by her horrible neighbour. And then everyone just moves on as if she didn't say anything. Yeah, nobody comes to a defense. <laughs> no, nobody does anything to help her. So she just including I think she Ned. Just, yeah, I think that's the sad part about Maud's life is that this is just something she's become adjusted to and she just thinks, I don't think she takes it personally, I think she still thinks, well, that was a good idea, but, you know, they're going to go with something else and she's also clearly on board with the final idea, so. Oh yeah, she's she's persuaded as are the rest of the town, but um, the other thing is, she sees Mr. Schnurb, now she's no fool, she knows it's Mr. Burns and she sees him at his, at his true, in his true wicked guy guys after seeing him the last two times she's run into him he's really been a savior especially when he dropped like almost 200 grand on them in the left orium yeah this is the first time she's really seen him but again she she could naively believe that that's not mr burns yeah like but i think more than that exactly she ain't just some comic foil. But anyway, so she stands up, gives a good idea, gets shouted down, and then sees this monster step up and try to take the money. But then very quickly, very quickly, she as the rest of the town are persuaded by Lyle Landley to invest all of their money in this monorail idea. And as Bart says, sorry, mom, the mob has spoken. And then in true Busby Berkeley, like Hollywood style, they storm out of the, onto the steps of the town hall and they march down in sync. And Maud and Ned are leading the charge. They're either a minute ago, they were almost at the front of the stage. Somehow they've managed, unlike last week's episode with the church where they held back, this time they've actually somehow managed to get themselves to the front alongside Police Chief Wiggum and Diamond Joe and they're marching down the steps you know full on song and dance happily laughing and this is one of the, the things you said about her the singing in the ensemble we're never going to be, be able to pick out Maud's voice in that uh, is she still miming? Uh, yeah but I think this might be hearing everybody else sing might help her out a little bit that happens a few more times yeah okay. so I think we we'll start for thinking starting to believe in herself because she's got the dance moves down she's dancing in sync to everybody else absolutely it is interesting that uh, after this you don't see her at the monorail uh, you know like event and you don't see her on the monorail <laughs> this is the last time you see her in this episode now we we gotta we gotta give the Simpsons camera crew some you know a little bit of slack. They might not catch everybody on camera, so there are it is possible that Maud was just slightly off camera, but also very possible that once again she really put her weight behind something and then didn't show up. Uh, that seems yeah. to be a little bit of a trait for Maud as well. My theory was that she felt a little bit swept up. She felt a little bit embarrassed that she got swept up in the whole mob mentality kind of situation, which does happen to her quite a lot, but I don't think she likes it about herself. So I think maybe out of uh, pride or some kind of stubbornness, they thought, we're not going to, we're not bothered about this monorail, really. We got swept up, but we're going to go and put this fire out ourselves. Ah, That's cool. so, so one theory, 
one while you is while the rest of the town is uh, riding the monorail ned and maud are doing some amateur firefighting but uh, if it is the tire fire then clearly they failed and probably inhaled a whole bunch of very noxious fumes so win 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 one might say yeah where are the kids during this point and you know generally when we keep seeing you know maud and ned out together who's looking after the kids well, I don't know, actually, because the whole... Marge makes a point of saying, wow, the whole town turned up, and then it cuts to, like, Snake, or, like, just some, like, criminal just robbing everybody's houses. So the kids must... Yeah, all the kids... I imagine there's some kind of side room at this town hall meeting where all the kids are being looked after by... Ironically, a good choice would have been Maud, but let's say um, maybe the Sunday school teacher or Disco Stew. It'd be good if Disco Stew ran a, ran a daycare centre. But obviously, Lisa and Bart are in the room, so that story is not, that theory is not without some holes. But, you know, yeah. who knows? Maybe it was optional for the kids. Yeah, and maybe Lisa. Lisa definitely would want to be involved in this kind of thing, and maybe Bart's there just to annoy her. Yeah. But are there any other kids? Didn't anywhere? see like, any. No yeah. Ralph, no Morris, no Martin. Yeah, none of those. Moving on. Next, it's season four, episode 15. I love Lisa. Written by Frank Mueller. Directed by Wes Archer. Aired February 11th, 1993. So the Simpsons are at the table. It's Valentine's Day. Marge has made an I love you out of bacon and eggs. It looks delicious for you meat eaters out there. Bart says to Homer, I'm sure you've got lots of things planned. And Homer tries to play it off because clearly he's done nothing, right? As you'd expect for Homer, Jay. Um, nobody makes a big deal of Valentine's Day. Cut. Look out the window and Ned Flanders is dressed as a full body costume as a giant love heart with a little pink guitar. And he's playing a version of Rod Stewart's Do You Think I'm I'm sexy, but he's changed the lyrics to. Um, if you think I'm cuddly and you want my company, come on, why he let me know. He's uh, Maud's gazing out of the window, so he's singing up to her almost Romeo and Juliet style. He's given Maud a single pink rose, and she's gazing at him with love in her eyes. And uh, then he howls, oh! And uh, and Maud brings the rose to her nose and. And smiles and sniffs the rose. Cut to Bart. Hey, why don't you give mom her present? And uh, I'm sure madness ensues in the Simpsons house not long after that. So what do we make of that? Um, again, it's the mirror of reflection. It's look how prepared Ned was. But I, I'm, I'm inclined to disagree with you about saying she has love in her eyes. To me, she again looks like she's just, she doesn't look present to me. She looks, she has a similar expression to the golf game where she looks completely, whatever's going through her mind isn't, isn't what's happening in front of her. The girl with the faraway eyes, you might even say, if you were a Rolling Stones fan. Yes. So we don't think that she's really bought into this. Well, my next question was going to oh, be... Yes. Now, my question is, what did Maud do for Neddy on that day? You know, because, you know, Mars did the I Love You bacon and, and Neddy's obviously pulled out all the stops. What's Maud's Valentine's Day offering up to the altar of Neddy? I like to think that in the theme of redemption and sticky let's say that this is the first valentine's day since the marriage counseling so i like to think that she's bought him a new personalized bible Ooh. with his name his name on it and nothing underlined so his neddy flanders embossed on the cover of the of the bible or maybe on the inside cover you don't want to be putting your name on the front of the bible probably but yeah that would be a nice gift wouldn't it that would be an excellent gift for ned especially after she more or less ruined his last one by scribbling all over it did she make did she make him a nice breakfast as well? Similarly, an I Love You um, bacon and eggs ensemble? I think so, yeah. I think that was something that maybe, maybe Marge, Marge and Maud maybe took some skills from each other. And I think mm. that they both got that from the, I think that might have been a mad idea and Maud has taken it on board. Interesting. Interesting theory that they would might swap and change those kind of housewifely stories in such a quaint way. It could even be a Springfield tradition, the I love you exit yeah. making. Because Marge is um Marge is more enamoured to Homer than Maud is to Ned, I would say, because Ooh. you know Marge puts up with a lot more stuff. And we again just predominantly from it being the TV show The Simpsons, we see a lot more of Marge, you know, being nice to Homer and doing nice things 
things for Homer, but you, you rarely see Maud doing anything for Ned. She's generally supportive, although we did question that with the fact that she didn't even bother to show up for his Streetcar Named Desire show. However, yeah. she's generally supportive in spirit, but yeah, maybe she we haven't seen her do much other than the odd club sandwich here and there, which you know. Yeah, I imagine she is a good, I imagine she makes good food. Ooh. Healthy food, wholesome food, like the meatloaf and, and vegetables she sure, shared last week, maybe. All right, yeah. clip five, and we're in the, basically the school hall. It is now ready for a performance, and uh, Principal Skinner comes up and he says, you know, welcome to the theatre for a night of entertainment and picking up after yourself. Haha, <laughs> they obviously think that's some kind of joke, so they come back to the audience, and there's tumbleweed sounds and people coughing. Oh, oh, oh. And that's where we see Ned and Maud and Police Chief Wiggum again, next to each other for the second clip in a row. Nobody else in recognisable in the audience other than those three. And the drawings of them are, I could only describe it as amateurish. Um, yeah. Their faces look like, you know that alien, that Trios of Horror one where they get taken over by body snatchers and their faces are slightly off. Is it Bob Dole and Bill oh. Clint or whoever and their faces are all, they're not quite as they should be. Everyone's face is right. exactly what it looks like. Yeah, she's, um, this is one of my favourite. I think I already had a picture of that knocking about because it's my favourite mod. She's facing forwards again. Yes. For a start. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, she just looks creepy it's weird it's really cool drawing but it's like it's kind of like how i would draw my fun as a ned uh from front on anyway so with the the um they launch into the kids launch into again one of my favorite simpson songs the one about the mediocre presidents and um you know once again Maud is for the second time in these clips and for like the 10th time in a row in the presence of music but this time you don't have to persuade me why she is or isn't singing but rod and todd are singing and they are presenting this song about the caretaker presidents of the usa and uh super funny it might be good to drop in you know alf Clausen, who wrote all the music and obviously is a genius writing all these different styles. But the lyrics were written by Jeff Martin, who we've talked about before, who was a writer on several of the early shows, but very funny. So Rod is playing um, Zachary Taylor, the 12th president of the USA, who lasted a single year. And Todd, the taller one, I, be I believe is playing John Tyler, who was the 10th. Now he took over from William Henry Harrison. I died in 30 days, my favorite line in that song. And yeah, I remember, uh, remember that still as a, that, that stayed as a fact in my head that's becoming like quizzes as it come in handy that I know that guy's name just from that. Also, you mixed up Rod and Todd, but we'll let it slide. Oh, good Lord, what did I do wrong? Todd is Todd is the small one. Rod did I is say the tall Todd, one. Did I say Todd was the tall one? Oh, I'm I know. Afraid so. Listeners, reverse the tape and check if that's true. If I did, well, cover me in eggs and flour and call me a pancake because I should know that by now, shouldn't I? Eight episodes in. The only thing of note that I have to say about this is that Rod and Todd are at the school performing in a school performance. Yes. But we still have never, at no point, we've seen them in the classrooms. And um, yeah, it makes sense that Chief Wiggum's sat there because this is a Ralph episode and he's ah. the lead in this play and stuff but it doesn't make sense that if the whole audience is random people they've picked Ned and Maud to be watching Rod and Todd but they, you could have easily removed all four of those characters from that scene and lost nothing. It is weird that, that again for like the second or third time the only recognisable people are the Flanders but I wonder at that point whether it really was just that the Flanders were like the top tier of secondary characters once you'd got Apu and Chief Wiggum Maybe the Flanders were the next thing, and maybe they had the same discussions we had. Well, you know, if the kids are there, if it's not Ralph, Rod and Todd have got to be there, and if Rod and Todd are there, then, then Ned and Maud have got to be there. I'm hoping they have the same level of discussion and take it as seriously as we do. No! Maud! Maud would be there! It's strange, though, that, again, it makes sense that Ned and Maud are the sort of the next people in terms of adults, but Rod and Todd are pretty low down on the list of kids, because you've got, yeah, like, Ralph, Milhouse, Martin, Sherry, and Terry. Richard and I want to say Lewis were knocking about a lot in the oh, early yeah, days yeah. as well. When Nelson, you know, like Rod and Todd are very low down on this list of which kids can we use. Right. Well, I think we milked a good five out of that clip, which is essentially just a one single frame of a badly drawn mod. So let's move on. Coming at you next, it's season four, episode 16, Deathless, written by David M. Stern, directed by Jim Reardon. Aired February 18th, 1993. So Duffless may be a reference to the film Breathless, uh, but I can't remember what happens in that film. 
or maybe a reference to another film that I can't think of right now. But anyways, they're sat at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting by the looks of it. And an interesting range of characters there. You've got Homer, who I'm guessing has had to go there because of his madness during this episode. I can't quite remember, but I know something along those lines. Reverend Lovejoy and Helen Lovejoy. Lionel Hurts, the the, uh, the lawyer. Hutch. Otto. Lionel Hurts, sorry. Otto, who likes to get blotto. Hans Molman. Uh, Carl. And a couple of people uh, I don't think are characters. That's strange. I've not I'd noticed everybody except for Carl, actually. Uh, Helen's there for in the same way as the marriage retreat, I think. I don't think she's participating. Ah, but, so uh, I think it's a church group and, and the Reverend and Helen are just uh, facilitating. Yeah. Hans Molman has the best line of the scene, though. With, uh, Drinking has ruined my life. I'm 31 years old. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But Homer's there because uh, Marge, Marge basically asked him to go a month without beer. I don't think he did anything that insane. He certainly didn't do anything as bad as the house party with the fly and the glass and the cleavage. No, it's, it is the weird thing where the the level of reaction isn't always to the level of the crime, but it's just what's required by the show. But I would have really gone to town and made Homer do some really horrific stuff if I was going to send him to uh, rehab at this point anyway so Neddy stands up and he says it's been 4,000 days since my last drink which is what 11 years or something like that since my last and first blackberry snaps and then we see a flashback to the Fan- Flanders bedroom and there's just pictures of Ned and, and Maud <laughs> several places all over the wall which I thought was somewhat narcissistic nobody else the telephone is on Maud's side at this point. Now, this is a flashback 11 years. So at some point, Neddy's managed to wrestle it over his side. So he's got quick access to call Lovejoy in the middle of the night. But Maud's looking concerned. Maybe she's she knows Neddy's been hitting the schnapps. I don't know. Ned, did you clip Anne Landers today? Now, Anne Landers is like an agony aunt from the from like the newspapers. And so basically, I'm guessing she makes like um she makes like a scrapbook or something of clippings from Anne Landers. And Lander's like agony ant page. Anyway, so um, so Ned, he's a bit, he's a little bit, you know, worse for wear after this this schnapps, and he says, "Anne, Anne Landers is a boring old biddy." Maud gasps, <gasps> puts her hand to her mouth, and she has done several times so far in this in, in our journey, and she says, "Ned," and then we cut back because the drunk booze hound is just so unaware of the intensity of thing he's just said. But later, as we realize, he comes to his senses and we see him now in real time, he says, I was more animal than man. What do you make yeah. of that? Well, firstly, I didn't. I was going to look up who Anne Landers is because even I still haven't looked it up after uh, you know twenty nine years or whatever of watching this episode. Well, I've got um, I've got I, some Anne Landers facts. So when you finish, the, you know, look, going through the the scene, I did look it up because I, I I somewhere in the back of my head I knew that Anne Landers was either either a, like a TV show host or like an agony aunt. So I looked it up. I got some some pretty fun facts about Anne Landers for you once you've had a go at this. Nice. I kind of assumed that it was a TV show they were talking about which I always thought it was a weird you know like choice of phrase when she said did you clip on Landers I always Man, did you record an episode? And I just thought it was sort of a weird Fargo sort of word, maybe. Ah, but, um, interesting. She's more shocked by this than, um, I don't know, actually. I was going to say the vegetables, but maybe it's around the same yeah. as the vegetable situation. Also, it's nice to know that they've had the house for 11 years, so they must have been there longer than The Simpsons. Oh. Because The Simpsons, have, well, The Simpsons have been there for, yeah, like 10 years because they got, they moved in, no, maybe like eight years they moved in when they were gonna have lisa i think into that mm. house and Ned and Maud were already there we just didn't know how long they'd been there and my final point to make is that when she dies the praise land episode when he he talks about Maud's indentation in the bed from where she slept for all those years but she's on it's on the other side mm. and is it the same bed because they've got a four poster bed and i don't remember they always have a four poster yeah maybe it could be an older older frame and she eventually swaps sides but we need to keep our eye on the sides because we eventually she's supposed to be on the other side eventually mm. yeah so one other thing before i give you the ann landers facts is that this is another couple of like really cool and goofy drawings of Maud. I really like it when they draw Maud from strange angles and gasping because they, they, 
just don't seem to know how to do it often. And so her face just gets contorted into the... So last week, it was like Donald Duck. And this one here, it's like, again, it's super goofy, I think, because she has that big overbite or her top lip kind of comes out. So she, she, yeah. she kind of looks super weird from a lot of angles. They kind of just... Again, I think it's because we're still in the early days of uh, animation and stuff that everybody sort of has. Like, if you look on the... There's sort of a lot of screen caps online of weird looking sims you know, like like mid turn and stuff like that and they yeah. just look weird and they're all from I'd say we're going to maybe start losing that next season. Hopefully not, but I think they get more of a grasp on how everybody looks. Trend up those new animators because actually a while back when we talked about the t-shirts, Maud loves Nell. There's a theory that the L is actually a D, but it was not coloured in very well. And so they cut off the curve of the D so it looks like Nell. Is that your theory? No, actually, bizarrely enough, that is something that <laughs> when I started started looking at it for I typed in Ma, Ma, um, sorry what did I say Maud loves Nell right and it, and it did come up and somebody had made a comment on some reddit page or somewhere don't have any more facts for you than that all right let me drop some Anne Landers facts on you so essentially Anne Landers was the name of a couple of pseudonyms of people but the main one was a was a woman who wrote uh, under the name from like the 1950s essentially all the way up until uh, something like 2005 or something like that so for like 50 odd years and what's really weird is that she's like middle america conservative which would make sense for Maud to like her but through the 50 odd years she threw out some really kind of like left field things so for example she was she was campaigning for um a homosexual civil rights from the 60s onwards but at the same time denouncing it as unnatural uh, she was making cases for legalized prostitution and pro-abortion, but at the same time consistently giving people um, advice that was very conservative and about moral decisions and things like that and, and self-responsibility and things. So it's a little bit weird and I just wondered how Maud would have taken on some of those things. I mean, this is a person she obviously loved. She's clipping out on a daily basis or getting Ned to clip out those um, those clips. I don't, I, we don't have time to go into the down this rabbit hole too much but i'm just going to say one more thing the funniest thing that i saw in the ann landers research that i do in 1996 she informed her readers that they should avoid throwing rice at weddings because if birds eat it they will explode <laughs> yeah i've heard that a lot i didn't know it came from ann landers well, the That's advice a... was apparently erroneous, as the rice is not harmful to birds, and she was she later recanted. Oh, really? That's still a thing that goes around that you shouldn't do. It's in common law. But to answer your question, I think she, it sounds like it, she sounds like a very Maud person. I imagine Maud's general outlook on things that might be a little controversial to Catholic to Christians. Um, I think she might have a similar opinion of I right, like you. You do what you want. Nothing is wrong. You you are, you have the free will to do what you choose, but it also doesn't mean I have to like it. So Oof. you can do what you want, but I I can have the opinion that I don't think it's good, and we can live civilized. Yeah, I mean, I like that. We can go with that. I'm going to throw that in the moditorium, and we'll bring it back again for another for another uh, route later in our lives. A little one follows this. It's season four, episode twenty, Whacking Day. Written by John Swartzwelder. Directed by Jeff Lynch. Aired April 29th, 1993. Barry White, the singer. It's Barry White, right? Yes. Yeah. Barry White, the singer, is on Homer's lawn shouting hooray for snakes. Maud is kind of just... I couldn't tell if it was actually Maud because it was so fuzzy, but I'm going to take a stab that it's definitely Maud. She's over one side, not with Ned by the looks of it, and Rod and Todd seem to be over the other side, away from them, behind Krusty and Sideshow Mel, and some of them are waving sticks around because this is the episode where they have the sticks and they decide to hit snakes. I, I, but but I'm guessing that at this point they've stopped hitting the snakes because Diamond Joe turns up with a bunch of dead snakes and uh, gets booed. Yeah, uh, this is basically the last like two minutes of the episode. You don't see her at all participating in the snake beating. You only see her in this brief, probably not even a full second. 
of her in this crowd, but I have looked and she isn't in any other crowd shot of this entire episode. She only appears in that brief second to celebrate the end of what. So it's another one of the more non-participations where she just appears to turn up either at the beginning or end of something, but she doesn't actually take part in the thing itself. Why does she do that? She just seems to do it a lot. Like the monorail, like you said, and, and Neddy's play and things like that. How she did watch the kids do, do the president song, but she seems to be absent a, a lot of the time. I think there's a whole mob mentality thing, like I said, going on in which in the heat of the moment, she's she's got like a fire behind her. And then, you know, she gets home, she spends four hours making club sandwiches and making wind chimes. And then she realises, she's like, oh, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to stay in. She gets distracted by her own little mod world, doesn't she? She knows that there's, there's, there's a whole sp 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 Springfield out there waiting for her, but she but she likes that internal mod, and she likes to go on a little bit of a mod modcation. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. What did she make of this idea of whacking animals to death with sticks? Well, again, the fact that she only shows up now to celebrate it being disbanded is telling. Ah. Again, I look through the crowds though and it's still, because it's still early days, there's no recognisable characters in a lot of the crowds, so I think it's just a case of that. But in story terms, I think she's dead against it, so that's why she's out now, celebrating that it's ended. Yeah, so she, she's dead against it because she does. she's like an animal rights activist, or she just thinks it's, as a, as a Christian it's, it's cruel, or what's her... What's her take on it? I imagine she's quite similar to what Lisa's going through. It would have been a good, you know, maybe she could have gone next door for some advice. But uh, cause Marge, Marge is into whacking there, once again, showing that Marge is a Simpson, not a Flanders. Yes, no question mm. of that. I heard that Maud was Lisa's godmother. No. You sure it's in, Helen. The, it's in the Mauditorium? Helen's, Helen, Love Helen Lovejoy. I'm going to double check where I got my facts from, but I don't doubt you for a second. It was in, I, I can go further, it was in a 28 Days Later Halloween parody and the zombie Helen Lovejoy was on the front of the Simpsons car and Marge says to Homer, don't kill her, she's Lisa's godmother. Ooh, and that's where that, that came from. That's not non-canon. Is that a reference to another movie, you think? No. I don't think so. No, probably not. And to wrap it all up, Maud's biggest appearance so far. Season 4, Episode 21, Marge in Chains. Written by Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein. Directed by Jim Reardon. Aired May 6, 1993. Honestly, she's all over this one. The Simpsons? More like the Maud Flanderses. So there's a red jacket man who's being stung by bees and shouts, I'm cured. <laughs> I couldn't quite work out the reference to that. But we cut to the Flanders living room. Maud's looking worse for wear on the couch. Big bags under her eyes and looking looking somewhat dishevelled, wrapped in a blanket. Uh, visibly shaking with a book on her lap, which I am going to imagine is the Bible, unless we have any, any reason to think otherwise. But she's not the worst off in the family. Todd, Todd is delirious and he's shaking. And uh, I wish he were frothing at the mouth, but he's not. Yeah. And Rod says to his dad, you know, um, Todd's speaking in tongues. And, uh, and Eddie says, I wish he were, Rod. I pray for the day, but he's just delirious from fever. There's a lot here, so stop me at any point. Todd, stop you now. Go ahead. Um, the, one of the strange things is, it's, this is the most culturally relevant clip we're going to look at. Um, but also, there's an episode much later, and I can't remember where it is or what it is really, but I remember it vividly. And there is another time that Todd gets really ill like this, and he's like speaking in tongues. And then he goes, it's after Maud's died, and he goes silent and looks up at the sky and says, Mommy. <laughs> so he's at some point so delirious that he's imagining Maud is in the room. So mm -hmm. that's, how, that's the next time Todd gets ill. Uh, yes, continue. So... Maud says, oh, Neddy, why has God forsaken us? Which, as you know, is also what Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross, dying. He says, God, you know, why have you forsaken me? Arr. And um, doesn't shake his fist, of course, like I did, because his, his arms are nailed up. But, um, you know, they, they hug each other. 
And Ned says, I can't imagine what we could have done. And Maud's hunkering down, still shaking, eyes closed. And we cut to Ned realizing what he's done wrong. He's watching the 90s sitcom Married with Children. And uh, Peggy says to Al, oh, these plants are lifeless and limp. Maybe they'd be more at home in the bedroom. And uh, Ned, rather than turning this off in disgust, guffaws and and, and chuckles along. And and then the step. The sky cracks and uh, he says, oh, the network slogan is true. Watch Fox and be damned for all eternity. And of course, The Simpsons yeah. is on Fox, isn't it? So a little bit of a... Yeah, I do, I do like the Fox, the Fox shaming. It's quite fun. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good of Fox, really, to uh, allow all of this sort of stuff, especially back then when it was like a really not... It didn't, it wasn't a very, like, The Simpsons was sort of the thing that picked it up, wasn't it? Like it was a or, relatively I mean, huge. I mean, it's owned by Rupert Murdoch. Spit. So this was already a huge multinational corporation. So they weren't some little fledgling thing. But however, yeah, I mean, still allowing your primetime show to openly mock you. Yeah. A lot of people think that speaking in tongues and being possessed is a great thing. And I think Neddy would have loved it. However, no. Todd is just delirious with fever. I don't find out what happens to him. Or in fact, really, I have no context for why why Maud is looking so bad or any of this stuff other than possibly the bees. The bees, the bees, not the bees. Oh, yeah. No, the context is it's the... A flu arrives from Osaka, the Osaka flu, and it very quickly takes over the town and becomes a little bit of a pandemic. And the bees is, um, Dr. Hibbert says, uh, any medicine we give you will only be a placebo. And then those the people in the crowd start screaming, where are these placebos? It's one of the stupidest scenes I've seen, actually. It really made me laugh. But um, they say, oh, maybe they're in the back of this truck. And they open the back of this truck and just killer bees fly out. And then a man eats one of the bees thinking it's a placebo and says, I'm cured. I mean, ow. Yeah, I like that. That's quite funny. Maud's come down with the Osaka flu. Wow. Which in itself is uh, another full circle moment for this podcast. Well, I mean, only if people know anything about us other than we work at the Worsley Men's Maud Flanders Internet Museum database and theme park if they somehow believe we have parallel lives in which we don't live in the bins near worsley mains and they might know what that connection is and if you do Maybe. write it on a postcard and you'll get a no prize no more prize clip three this is the big one isn't it so Marge is in the house with Ned and Maud and Ned's showing off his new badge which says his name on it and he says I'll never have that trouble again but again I don't know what I don't know what trouble he had Maud she's just kind of standing there next to Marge with her big toothy grin just like just kind of smiling at Marge don't know really I've not any idea what's going on or if any of the Simpsons are there but um, Marge says if you'll excuse me I need to freshen up and she goes to the bathroom I'll give you a bit of context before you get to the back half of the scene because I have more to say about the back half Marge uh, accidentally stole something from the quickie mart and was subsequently arrested I think at this point the town knows and she's waiting to go to trial. I think Ned and Maud are trying to prove to her that, you know, we still were still your friend, but they also have no trust in her whatsoever. Uh, and expect does, the worst. Yeah. That does make what happened in this scene less less creepy. It's still creepy. Yeah. But without that context, it seemed incre- it seemed incredibly creepy. Yeah. And uh, so Maud follows Marge as she goes to the bathroom. Maud leans over to Ned and says, I'll, I'll, I'll go with her. We see Maud walking through the hallway with like these dead eyes and these limp arms. And uh, there's a big stuffed owl on the wall. And if you know anything about movies, it's starting to look pretty familiar. She takes the painting down off the wall and peers through a hole into the bathroom wall, right? Which is exactly like Psycho, the movie. And she's watching, she's watching Marge and Marge comes out, she's washing her hands. <laughs> As a pen, one, of the, one of the little flower paintings on the wall is slightly askew and, and uh, Marge fixes it. And Marge, <laughs> Marge gives the game away by shouting from the other side of the wall. Just wash your hands and get out. Something along the line. Yeah. This is one of my favourite mod scenes from start to finish because 
I really enjoy the Psycho parody, which it's the third in like a close amount of time as well. This is the third like shot for shot Psycho parody in The Simpsons. Really? Like they all they did Maggie hitting Homer over the head and the whole shower scene, okay. like shot for shot. And they did this, and they've done something with Skinner and his mum. And also Skinner's house is Norman Bates's house. Psycho killer, Norman Bates. Very into Hitchcock. Yeah, I also like that this is Maud just uh, just being flat out rude. She doesn't trust Marge at all. She hasn't given Marge the benefit of the day of, oh, maybe maybe this whole shoplifting thing must have, it must have been an accident. This is Marge. She's just thinking, no, this woman is scum. I'm going to follow her. I'm going to watch her in the bathroom. And I'm going to make sure she doesn't steal anything. She can't even handle Marge touching the picture. It, it fills her with so much visceral anger that she has to yell at her. Which does give the game away a little bit, because um, on the other side of the wall, where there's the painting, it, it says, God bless you. And the O in you, you just see Maud's eye poking yeah. through. Do you think, you think Maud made that God bless you sign? I think so. The real question is, why was this already in place? Like, it's handy to spy on Marge in this context, but unless they went to the the effort of putting all this together for this specific Marge coming around, but it also seems like, it seems like they invited her around. Maybe trying to catch her out, but yeah, it is a bit weird because, you know, most people's bathrooms don't have stalls as well, right? So this is a bit dodgy because it, in, in the original cycle, he's watching her getting ready for the shower. And there's a suggestion that maybe he's, uh, he's, he's getting a little bit of a thrill out of it, especially if you see the remake. Do you know there was a remake of Psycho with Vince Vaughn as Norman Bates? Where they, and yeah. this, was the, this was the controversial scene, I don't know if you remember, because Gus Van Sant who made it, he basically made it scene for scene without changing too much. But in this one, he decided to let Vince Vaughn get a little bit frisky with it. And uh, that was quite controversial. Whichever way you look at it, it's a dark parody. If you read into it a little bit more, you would be essentially looking at people weeing whenever you felt like it. Yeah, which is horrible. Yeah, I haven't watched the Vince Vaughn one. I mean to because I enjoyed him very much in True Detective. I enjoyed him very much in Dodgeball. Yes. Thought he was terrifying. Yes, his best. And also, I had another point in that they've also re remade it, haven't they, on a TV show? And uh, I believe Rihanna plays the lady. Really? Uh, what's her name? Can't you know remember. the one. Can't the remember. shower lady. Yeah, yeah. Can't remember. Tippy. Tippy Hedron. Tippy Hedron. Isn't that the actress? That's not the character's name. I don't know what the character is. It was, of course, Janet Lee. No, I don't, I don't care either. But moving on, this is some pretty dark stuff we've learned about Maud here. That, and Ned's obviously in on it. He knows that uh, they're doing this kind of stuff. But still, he gives a nod. Sorry? He gives a supportive nod. It is, doesn't he? Now, we don't see any fallout from this. Maud kind of, kind of um, spies on Marge on the, in, in the toilet. And um, we imagine she saw the whole thing because she, she arrived straight after Marge did, which by itself is pretty gross. But she, after that, Marge just kind of grumbled in that kind of like uh, that, that kind of noise she makes. And then the next thing we see is she's in court. Helen Lovejoy, no love lost, does the, the old drinky poos movement with her hand to suggest that people think that Marge might be a little bit of a booze hound herself. We see, we see Maud sat directly, directly behind the Simpsons family, um, looking pretty unhappy and glum. Couldn't quite get a read on this one. Yeah, I think she's, they've obviously included her because of the, this is sort of, to me, the follow-up to the last scene and that they obviously wholeheartedly believe she's a criminal and kind of want to see her brought to justice. Seems to be the, the theme of why I think that there. Again, this sort of Marge darkness inside her. I think part of her wants to see Marge go down and these poor kids lose the mother, which in a, in a horrible twist of fate happens to her own children. Well, there you go. Be careful what you wish for, isn't it? You know, are you suggesting that maybe in the same way that the Homer wish death almost on Flanders, that uh, all of this death wishing eventually found its place uh, and it settled on model in Flanders? Yes. The other thing is all of the three most, except for the one, but the three most prominent Maggie Roswell characters, Maud, Helen and Miss Hoover, 
in this episode all really like nasty to match. Like we have the Maud stuff and then we have Helen doing this and then there's a scene with Miss it's like Miss Hoover and the Hibberts and someone else. And Miss Hoover tells him that Marge has uh, webbed toes. Oh no, Miss uh, Dog Hibbert says that, but <laughs> Miss Hoover's the insulting Marge. <laughs> so I mean the town turns quickly, doesn't it? Maybe yeah. it's, it's a warning of mob mentality. That's the that's the lesson we learned from the whole show. In some in some regard, but why is Maud looking glum behind the Simpsons family while while Helen's on the stand? Because you would imagine she would be all in favour of this stuff. I get the impression that there's a lot of passive aggression between Maud and Helen. I don't believe they are actually friends, and I'm basing this off the fact that Helen isn't at Maud's funeral. <laughs> oh yeah. But, I For no reason. We will learn a lot when we dissect that funeral about who did and who didn't come because we already know her family didn't come and also her best yeah. friend Helen didn't turn up. So the sea captain did turn up. You want to throw in a couple of you want to throw in an idea as to why that's the case? I think we'll get there in time. We'll get there in time. So clip four. So Lionel Hutz is in the courtroom with his Kentucky Bourbon, exhibit A. The brownest of brown stuff. Um, now, I always assumed, I just thought this was a given that Lionel Hutz was based on Jack Nicholson's character from Easy Rider, who's like a drunk lawyer. I couldn't find anything on the internet. I just thought, I better check. Just get some quotes and some people backing me up on this. Nobody. It seems like it was just me that, uh, that thinks that's what he's based on. Yeah, no, I never, I never made that connection. But... I've only kind of half seen Easy Rider, so that might be why. I'm going to go back and watch the scenes where Jack Nicholson's yeah. in it as the as the lawyer because, yeah, I can't believe that um, that people aren't agreeing with me. One of the best Simpsons characters also. Yeah, sadly retired now, isn't he, since Phil Hartman passed away. Him and Troy McClure, I guess, are no longer uh, speaking characters. Sadly. It also sort of coincided with the decline in the uh, comedy, to be honest. Your argument is that Hutz and McClure were the real comedy backbone of The Simpsons. I do think, I think they brought a lot more than what, what we expected or what we assumed at the time, because there is, there's, a, there's a notable gap once they're gone. Hartman's characters, those two, had just that wacky, wackiness. Did he do any others? Monorail guy, Lyle Lundley. Yes, he's a one-off though, isn't he? Did he any, do any other recurring characters? No, not really. I think he does one or two other one-offs, but no, it was just those two. Hudson McClure would be would be good to dig into those guys a little bit at some point. But anyway, that's yeah. not what we're here for, is it? So Exhibit A, so tempting. Maud's looking concerned as Lionel Hutz is cradling this bottle of Kentucky bourbon. What? You want me to, you want me to drink you? But I'm in the middle of a trial. And then he puts it down and he runs out of the courtroom and we expect him to be going to buy some booze. But um, I know that he's actually phoning David Crosby, the rock star, his, uh, yeah. his, his support partner or whatever they're called. His sponsor. Yeah. One day at a time. <laughs> um, so behind The Simpsons, this is why I was asking about Maud being directly behind Homer and, and Marge. Because you got Patty Selma, and then the four Flanders is, and then on the other side you have Helen Lovejoy, and she's the only recognisable character. Those are the only recognisable characters, but they're sat directly behind the Simpsons, right next to Patty and Selma, and then Helen Lovejoy is right on the other side, behind, I guess, the the prosecutors. Yeah, I think that Maud and Ned are the under the guise of support, oh. but. That's not what they're, because uh, this obviously the sat, I don't know if courtrooms work the same as weddings, but they're sat on Margie's side. Let's assume that's how they work. <laughs> yeah, so it seems to me that Ned and Maud are sat there in a supportive role, but I don't, don't entirely believe that, because Maud has a full arc in this episode, so at this point she's still on the side of things would be better if Marge Simpson was in jail. Yeah, so, so okay, but Marge also knows that, that Ned and, and Maud don't support her because they spied on her while she was on the toilet and told us to get out. Do you think the, the Flanders maybe made up 
a little bit with her and try to get her back on side, at least try to, you know, pretend that they supported Marge a little bit, or is there bad blood between them right now? No, I think neither. I think Marge, everybody in Springfield, has the biggest ability to uh, let things go. She's a forgiver. She, so nobody else could deal with the shenanigans she deals with. Moving on to clip five. Something bad gone down after the trial, but I don't know what that is. However, they're now at a beautify our parks bake sale. Helen Lovejoy and Maud have a flagship stall full of cakes that are really hard to describe because they just look like piles of piles of slop. But let's assume that there's some kind of cake. And a man comes up and says, "Do you have any of those delicious marshmallow squares?" And Maud says. I'm sorry, Marge Simpson makes those. And then it looks like there's some pain in her eyes. Is it shame? Is it pain? Is it false pride? Because she realizes that, that people love people love Marge's cakes better than hers. What is it? What's that response to the marshmallow man? I think that she's just beginning to see the problem. Uh, the thing that's happened and I thought Margin Chains would have been the giveaway, but Marge is now in prison. Um, what's that look on, on Maud's face when the Marshmallow Man wants to buy the cakes? Oh, yeah. I think it's neither of those things. She's realising that Marge wasn't an awful person and that she might have gone too far. And I do like the first thing she says is, I'm sorry. She's very apologetic immediately to this man. Because she wants that sale, though, isn't it? I don't think it's about Marge at this point. It's just that she wants that almighty moolah from that man. And we, re we find out later that she was right to want that moolah because immediately the entire crowd just turns and walks away. They don't want any of Lovejoy's or Flanders cakes. And Helen and Maud, they just look at each other and we cut away. But I'd like to think, what did they say to each other in that moment when everybody walked away and took that $15 with them. I imagine that Helen blamed Marge and Maud silently agreed with her, but still continued this kind of feeling bad. But I think she would rather agree with Helen than start a haul of the can of worms. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? It's clear that neither of them are ready to admit that maybe they're in the wrong just yet. But it's going to hit him where it hurts, in the wallet, because everyone leaves. And uh, we cut to some kind of park ranger who's counting the money. And he turns to some dude next to him and he says, we're $15 short. That's exactly what Marge Simpson's marshmallow squares would have brought in. And we see Maud in the background looking on passively. Can she hear? Is she aware of the repercussions that by them? pursuing this false justice of getting Marge Simpson sent down, in the end, they've actually undermined their own plan to make the parks of Springfield more beautiful. Yeah, I think that's exactly what she's thinking in these moments. I imagine they've already counted the money and realised that they might be short. What, what would have been savvy of them is to add that $15 themselves to compensate but neither of them thought of doing that and i think at this point it's hitting more that you know it's hitting more so than when the the man left and all the people left that you know she ain't all that without marge and they need her exactly so, jimmy carter yeah history's greatest monster apparently that's just a joke right yes i think so i hope so because as you know, as the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter struggled to respond to formidable challenges, including a major energy crisis, as well as high inflation and unemployment. In foreign affairs arena, he did reopen US relations with China and made efforts to broker peace in the historic Arab-Israeli conflict, but was damaged later in his term by the hostage crisis in, in the Iran, not Japan. In 1980, he was defeated, boo, in a general election by, I'll give you a clue. Reagan. It was Ronald Reagan. 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 I always met Reagan. Order up. Ooh. Reagan? No Reagan. No good. Anyway, that might be all we have to say about clip five. Clip six, apocalypse. A pack of police dogs attacking Chief Wiggum 
He's on the ground wriggling. Rampaging mob with pitchforks. Upturned car on fire. Sofas and fridges being looted. Maud up close, right in the center of the shot, it, with deep regret, hands clasped. This would never have happened if Maud Simpson was here. Cut to Maud heading for the gates of Chokey. Maud Simpson. Is that um, what I said? Did I say Maud again? Uh, we should definitely have like a swear jar where when I, usually me, but you've done it a couple of times, but 99% of the time it's me. I should have like a, you should have a, a clinking sound, clink. And after, when I put, in fact, I'm going to, following my error, there'll be a clinking sound and that's a coin hitting the, the Maud jar when I accidentally call Marge Maud or Maud Marge or even Marge's mum or Maud's mum, Marge or Maud's mum or grandmum. So that's what that sound was. Good idea. That I may yeah. not have put in. I was confused. Marge yeah, she gets is heading for the prison gates. Maud is regretful of all the bad stuff that's gone down. Yeah, and she's... Sort of, this is the end of her story arc here, isn't it? In that she's learned a valuable lesson. And um, her accent's quite thick now, isn't it? Have you noticed that? I haven't noticed, but I'll have, I'll have a bit more of a listen. She's got a little bit of a twang in there, for sure. It's a little bit more defined. Yeah. Yes, which I like. Yeah, it's all sort of from her perspective, this little part, isn't it? She's the one witnessing the on the unfolding of society well i only got i only got six seconds of it i think because maud we just got a snapshot but do we see more of this madness unfolding or is that all we get to see uh you see slightly more but it's pretty much just the same and it was right it was maud's fault essentially in helen lovejoy i think so yeah i can't really remember why they're writing yeah I don't know if it's got with the, the bake sale or not so Something happened because the next the next scene with Ma that Maud Maud is not really in the next scene, but the next scene is uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, but the statue's been changed. But I'll give no spoilers because come back to it in a minute. But if I'm trying to if I'm trying to put this madness together, we saw Marge got sent down to prison. Then we saw a bake sale where they failed to secure the amount of money they need for a Lincoln statue, and now. The town is on fire and there's looting and rampaging, and then Marge is out of prison. So, it, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But what? But but Maud has been on a journey in this episode, and we need to focus on that. I don't think there's anything more to the story, really. I think that's exactly what happens. Marge goes away and everything goes wrong, and then she returns and everybody cheers and gives her a statue. It's the most we've dealt with so far in terms what, of appearance. What's Maud's journey? She I, was. I didn't see any journey other than at the beginning she was spying on Marge. And then she got a bit bitchy with the bake sale. And then she kind of thought, oh, oh, I, I regret that. Although she didn't actually regret anything she'd done. She just seemed to regret Marge not being there. Yeah, that is the journey. She started off suspicious of Marge. And by the end, she is understanding that they need her and that she's not bad after all. You reckon? Is she a, um, a necessary evil in Maud's eyes or is she a force of good? At this point, I think Maud might be thinking that Marge is good rather than like at least some kind of glue that holds everything together. Really? Why do you think that? She has a lot of regret. There's a lot of regret in her voice. She is filled with the... remorse for something that she may or may not have done. Yeah. And I think she feels partially responsible, even though she didn't really do anything wrong. It was Helen Lovejoy who started this ball rolling, wasn't it? And more just, she was just a bystander and let it all go down. And But she didn't yeah. really cause the problem. No, but she was definitely, she wasn't supportive. No, well, she was supportive of Helen, but not supportive of, of Marge. And once again, she was stirring the shit and she was just watching it go off. Do you think deep down inside there was a lot of glee that Marge got sent down and really the only thing she cared about was that, you know, oh, actually they might come and take my fancy stuff. So let's get, let's get Marge back. Yeah, I think there was part of her that was obviously invested in seeing her go to prison going to hell even at the end yes she she even says she you can say 
this would never have happened if Marge Simpson was here. Maybe coming from a place of joy. Doesn't sound like it is, but she might be saying, you know, this couldn't, this never would have happened if Marge was here. It's like an anti, it's a wonderful life. You know, Marge isn't there and the town has gone to heck in a handbasket. But I have no context for how quickly that happened and you seem to have forgotten. So something happened between Marshmallow Squares and the literal destruction of the entire town. Maybe somebody out there can remember what happened in those five or six minutes that led from a discussion about whether or not they could have afford a Lincoln statue to up to cars burning uptown on the streets of Springfield. Quite a distance. I do think, yeah, I think it's because of the statue. I think it's when the statue gets unveiled and they say he's history's greatest monster and then they start just rioting, I think. <laughs> So really, there's not a lot of depth to that kind of like regret of this wouldn't have happened if Marge was here. And as you seem to be suggesting, they could have just pitched in the fifteen dollars. You know, maybe yeah. we're applying too much logic to this situation. But I, I, you know, I like the writers to be like, all right, let's put a little bit of surrealism in there. But say, you know, what if they thrown in the fifteen dollars, and then bad stuff would have happened. It might be more interesting. But I think the writing's quite light at times. Because I've just been watching Community and I'm just thinking that Dan Harmon would have like, he he wouldn't have just taken that easy bait. If he was going to send Marge to prison, and I think similarly last time when we talked about Duffless, where Homer got uh, sent into rehab for pretty much minor indiscretions. You know, I think he'd, he'd taken Barney's keys and driven home and got stopped. But I'm pretty sure Homer drives drunk on a regular basis. And so it just like, it seems like a missed opportunity for some tight writing. Yes. Yeah. I might be wrong here again, but I think this might also be Conan. Hmm. I feel like he was responsible for this one. All right. But he's a gag man as well. And I think, you know, it's unfair to, to uh, compare them 15 years earlier to Dan Harmon, who's known for being like the tightest story arc writer in the game. Yes. But on fairness is what we deal in here, you know, so... So good, so for a game. Clip seven, Marge is back from prison and I didn't expect all of this, ooh. And there's a, all people out on the lawn. Welcome home, Marge, huge sign on the roof of the house. And Helen Lovejoy rocks up and says, we never should have let you go. From now on, I'll use my gossip for good, not evil. And there's three cheers for Marge. And Diamond Joe says, here's a special treat we have for you. And uh, they whip off the blanket off Jimmy Carter, put Marge's hair onto Jimmy Carter, and they change the plaque. And uh, not quite sure how this would beautify any parks, as it's now in the Simpsons front lawn. And I imagine disappears by the next episode. Maud and Nettie are there on the lawn. No boys. I don't know where the boys are, but they're standing there on the, on the, uh, on the lawn. Now, the first time they all clap, Maud doesn't clap. She's not. There's a clapping noise and a cheery noise, and Ma's just stood there motionless. Now maybe she's in shock. I don't know. Maybe she wasn't ready for this. She needed a little bit more time. Uh, however, there is a second round of applause, and Maud is now. She's in there. She's clapping, and and her mouth is waggling up and down really strangely in time with the claps. But it's not just her. It's everybody. Um. So there. There we go. Yeah. The I did notice that she wasn't clapping, which is again similar to the golf game when she was the only one not participating and just sort of standing still and watching. But then yeah, she uh, she obviously sees um, everybody taking Marge's side, and I think she would rather go along with the crowd in this situation than be the odd one out. Yeah, she's not doubling down and saying no. I think even though earlier when the town was burning, I um I, I wish that Marge was back now. Now that those cars are not on fire, actually, I wish she was still in prison. I wish she'd stayed there for the rest of her life. And she's probably thinking that or something along those lines. But then she looks around and she's like, oh, damn, everyone's noticed I'm not clapping. So I'll clap along, but I'm not going to stop thinking that thought. You can change my actions, but you can't change my mind, Springfield. Exactly. I think that's how it I went down. Yeah, I would agree. And uh, yeah, she's seems like she's learned some semblance of a lesson on the surface, but maybe not. No. Maybe she's just playing up to the cameras. Maybe the maybe the real lesson is just be better. Just be better at evil. There is that line running through because Helen Helen Lovejoy does say, I'll use my gossip for good, not evil. Now, does she stick to that? And if so, does Maud also join her in that? You know, from now on, we won't talk smack about people behind their back. 
but if we do, we'll do it for good, which is not really gossip, is it? Yeah, no, that doesn't uh, doesn't really happen. She just continues to drag everybody through the mud. Is there another example that you can think of where Maud's loose lips have sunk some ships? Not to this extent, but she certainly gets... This isn't the most sort of rude to Marge that we'll see her. Really? So spying on her in the bathroom and getting and standing by while she gets sent to prison is not the rudest she's been to, to, to Marge. Well, I'm looking no. forward to that. Don't give me any spoilers. So that was it. Is that the end of Maud's season four appearances? Yeah, that's it. What's the Maud story arc then in season four? You know, we've had, what, five or six appearances. What, what have we learned about? Her? She's been around more in season four than she was in two and three i think she's just sort of getting more fleshed out at this point isn't she she's they're adding this whole sort of layer with marge that they've not really they've had little moments but this is the first maud versus marge except for the statue of david but even that was just one comment and then walking away now it doesn't seem to really have a problem with the simpson family it's more maud that tends to be the one that's outraged and I think we're seeing that slightly more. And to be honest, fairly justified in her yeah. anger and uh, irritation with these clowns that live next door. And like you said, she'd probably get on best with Lisa, even though Lisa does go along with her shenanigans. Do we see much more Lisa interaction? Um, a small amount. I don't think ever just those two, but there's certainly times when Lisa's been around a mod. There's an episode where the Flanders pretty much get the Simpsons kids and Magagi starts to go down that biblical path but Lisa yeah. holds out there there is just a difference in ideology about how life should be lived you know the Simpsons very much represent the lower middle class America of, of the go-getters and the relaxification whereas Flanders represents a different side of America somewhat more right? so, somewhat more invested in those 1950s ideals uh, conservatives all love to look back at yeah. it's also sort of becoming more clear that Homer in particular thinks that the Flanders family are really lucky but on most occasions that we see them something really bad ha even in this episode they were almost all on death's door with this flu like she's quite mortal in terms of the Simpsons world yeah if there was a Flanders centric version of the Simpsons or as you know you could just click on Flanders and follow the Flanders through this adventure it would make less it would make less sense but they generally have more bad stuff happen to them yeah they have like really large like the Simpsons have like trivial bad things whereas yeah the Flanders have sort of you know the house will get destroyed or they'll invite everybody into the bomb shelter and Ned will be the only one who gets kicked out yeah but it's for laughs you know the old saying goes if, if you fall down a manhole and break your neck that's hilarious if I stub my toe that's a tragedy exactly exactly so we didn't learn too much of Maud's art we got more and more centric episodes but we didn't learn much more other than yeah she's a supportive wife and mother but she's got that vicious and mean streak in her especially for people that she doesn't like and she'll stand by and let bad stuff happen to those people and you know, she's very security and safety conscious in that area to the extent that she would drill a hole in her bathroom wall to peep at people. She's also supportive to an extent but clearly there's some kind of line that she draws because this season we saw her not, not turn up for the play that Ned was in and not turn up for the monorail that she was singing about. We've assumed that there's some kind of moral backdrop to that. It could have just been that, that Maud had a very busy evening and they couldn't find a babysitter. Who knows? But, you know, we'll keep our eye open to see if that's another trend. Another one in the bag. Nailed it. Nan Knight.